Yes. So uh, we welcome you to this online lecture by Dr. Aparna Bandhupadhyay on women's fiction in colonial Bengal. Uh, you all know that Gokhale Memorial Girls College Department of English has been conducting this year-long lecture series since January 2022 on various aspects of humanities and social sciences. And uh, in December, we are uh, clearly at the twilight of this lecture series. And today we are privileged to have Professor Bandhupadhyay with us. We will be speaking on uh, women's fiction in colonial Bengal. Uh, without further ado, let us read uh, some of the illustrious contributions that Professor Bandhupadhyay has made to academia. Uh, Dr. Aparna Bandhupadhyay is an associate professor in history at Diamond Harbor Women's University, West Bengal, India. She was formerly an associate professor in history in the West Bengal Education Service and had served several government colleges, including Lady Brebon College, Kolkata. She was awarded her doctoral degree from Jadupur University, Kolkata in 2012. Her book entitled Desire and Defiance, a study of Bengali women in love, 1850 to 1930, based on her, dissert uh, based on her doctoral dissertation, was published by Orient Black Swan in 2016. She has edited co-edited co four anthologies on women's studies. She has completed a research project on a leisure of women's own television mega serials and Bengali women in contemporary Kolkata. She has recently co-edited her story, A Fate Shrift for Professor Gerald Ryan Fawkes. Her research interests include the social history of colonial Bengal with a focus on social reform, women's everyday lives, violence, intimacy, emotions, and leisure. She is also interested in women's writing. Dr. Bandhupadhyay has presented papers at various international and national conferences. She has published extensively in journals and edited volumes. Readers can follow her work on academia.edu. So uh, with this, uh, Professor Bandhupadhyay, the stage is all yours and you can begin your lecture and thank you again for agreeing to deliver lecture to our college. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank everybody in the Department of English, Gokhil Memorial College, for inviting me to be a part of this very prestigious online lecture series. I feel honored and humbled and truly I am no expert. I'm not an expert uh, in any field. Uh, I'm uh, neither an expert in English literature nor in history, my parent discipline. But yes, I have worked for decades. I have researched for decades on uh, the history of women in colonial Bengal. And I've gained a little knowledge on uh, women in this milieu. And I want to share what I've gained through research with you a little bit of what I have gained uh, through my years of research with you all. Okay, so as uh, I've already uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I I'll be speaking on women's fiction in colonial Bengal. Now, as you all know, a tremendous literary efflorescence characterized the cultural scenario of Bengal since the second half of the 19th century and its hallmark was the novel. The novel, a long fictional narrative written in prose, was indeed a novel thing that happened to Bengal in the second half of the 19th century. While the creative genius of men such as Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, Sharad Chandra Chattopadhyay, and Rabindranath Tagore nurtured the Bengali novel to its maturity, there were hundreds of other novelists of lesser ability who crowded the literary arena, churning out one novel after another. The voluminous production of novels was engendered by the development of print technology that led to the proliferation of printing presses in Calcutta and elsewhere. The burgeoning 
print industry also facilitated the publication of an increasing number of journals and newspapers that wooed readers with the serialized publication of novels. Contributing to this enormous literary crop was also a sizable number of women novelists. A few among them stood out by virtue of their literary merits and popularity. Their novels ran into multiple editions and were enacted as plays in theatres. And later, uh, many of uh, these novels were uh, also published. Uh, Uh, reproduced on screen uh, in cinema uh, though a recent researcher claims that monotoma by uh, 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 published in 1868 was uh, the first original bengali novel uh, written by a bengali woman the earliest bengali woman novelist who earned critical acclaim as well as popularity was shanukumari devi undoubtedly shanukumari devi who made her uh, major appearance in the bengali literary arena with her novel deep nirban which was published in 1876 now the other uh, women stalwarts in the field of bengali fiction were uh, onurupa devi nirupama devi shoilobala ghosh jaya sheeta devi shanta devi ashalata singho jyotirmoy devi and uh, uh, many others all of whom wrote in the early decades of the 20th century now though all the women authors that i have named uh, have ma- had made their mark in their own contemporary times uh, m- most of them eventually disappeared from public memory now in recent decades uh, various individuals and institutions uh, engaged in research in women studies have actively uh, have been actively striving to retrieve and uh, reprint their writings and showcase their contributions to literature and society now western feminist approaches to women, women's fiction have focused on the distinguishing characteristics of women's writings the distinctiveness of the female language and imagination vis-a-vis that of men on the trajectories of a female literary tradition of uh, women writing their bodies into fiction uh while i appreciate the rigor in such theoretical engagements i am skeptical uh, spe- uh, skeptical about uncritically applying western theoretical paradigms to understand fiction penned by women uh, in uh, bengal and in other parts of uh, south asia closer at home uh, feminist scholars working on bengali women's fiction have been somewhat uh, naive in their approach highlighting the subversive content of their fiction and expressing their discomfort about writings that rearticulate patriarchal norms and values in a word uh, these critics tend to neatly fit women's fiction into the oppositional slots of feminist and patriarchal subversive and conformist now as a feminist historian looking at women's fiction i find such approaches simplistic and inadequate the context the specificities of the milieu that produced the text uh are according to me uh, uh an unavoidable point of entry uh into the world of women's fiction although it is trendy to pronounce that the author is dead examining the intent of the author the context and location of a text is important to the feminist project and so are the trajectories of the author's own uh life and i strongly feel that we need to move beyond the binaries of subversion and conformity to appreciate the significance of women's fiction uh, 
we need to unpack uh, instead the complex trance of uh, this uh, the subjectivity of the fictional uh, pro protagonist the interplay of contradictory emotions of diverse and disparate thought processes and see these as the manifestation of the author's own multi-layered subjectivity which is in turn shaped by uh, and in response to the prevailing patriarchal ethos uh the literary imagination of bengali women in the 19th century was an unintended byproduct of the of male initiatives to spread education among women when men decided to educate women they did so to make their women better wives better mothers and better homemakers education they made it clear was not meant to equip women for the public domain a woman's economic self reliance was considered an outrageous proposition the prospect of women writing novels and plays did not figure in the scheme of things of men who took care to specify the curriculum that women should be taught to enhance their conjugal maternal and domestic roles women were expected to strictly adhere to the specified curriculum and only read the books prescribed even a leisurely indulgence in reading novels and plays was tabooed and condemned for the detrimental impact they allegedly had on women's minds and morals fortunately the reformist patriarchy in colonial bengal could not uh successfully enfetter women's intellectual and creative faculties women read novels and plays at times clandestinely in the privacy of their bedrooms and even organized collective reading sessions in the uh, ondur mohol that is the inner domain of the household in the absence of their male guardians women did not stop at reading novels and plays they dared to express their creative imagination by writing novels and also trying their hand in other genres like plays short stories and poetry thus by their acts of reading and writing women silently subverted the reformist agenda an uneasy lack of confidence and a mood of secretiveness however marked the earliest forays of bengali women into the literary field the aura of hostility all around coupled with an internalized sense of the impropriety of their own creative activity contributed to create uh, an anxiety of authorship to borrow a phrase from gilbert and guber an obsessive fear the fear of criticism condemnation and ridicule haunted a woman writer's incipient literary initiatives most women lacked the courage to engage in their literary activities openly and a chance discovery by unsympathetic husbands and relatives often ended in a premature abortion of their literary aspirations the few who could make it were not necessarily the more fortunate ones in terms of familial latitudes again a rare attitude of encouragement and cooperation from husbands and other family members did not necessarily dispel the shyness hesitation and overriding uh, lack of confidence and the secretiveness of the literary women now shornu kumari devi was the fourth daughter of devendranath tagore uh, as you all know though she did not receive any formal education she received regular instruction at home uh in the in the zenana uh, mode of education her literary predilections which became obvious at a very early age matured easily in a family ambience in which almost everybody was engaged in some sort of creative activity or the other Uh, her marriage at the age of 13 to janokinath goshal uh, did in no way hamper her literary activities by the time she was 22 years old she had begun work on her maiden novel deep nirvan 
This novel, published anonymously 1876, hit the literary shelves of Bengal amid uh, setting critics agog with speculation about the author's identity. Even Shonu Kumari Devi's brothers had no idea that she had written this novel. Shotendranath Tagore, then in England, was deeply impressed by this book, but little did he imagine that it was written by his own sister. He speculated that it was written by his younger brother Jyotirindranath Tagore. Eventually, gaining the confidence to expose her own identity, Shonu Kumari penned one novel after another, and later, as editor of Bharati, she encouraged and inspired many other women to express their literary imagination in print. Ironically, Shonu Kumari Devi's a uh, very famous younger brother rovindranath tagore never thought highly of the merit of her works and had often gone public with his disparaging and even insinuating remarks on shonu kumari's literary abilities now onurupa devi the author of novels like mantra shakti ma gori bermi mohanisha and uh, many others all uh, all these were best sellers in in their own time uh, would not reveal her initial literary endeavors to anyone except her elder sister surupa devi who was a novelist herself writing uh, with the pseudonym indira devi now onurupa's husband uh, was not known to be hostile to his wife's literary pursuits yet when he insisted on being shown one of uh, onurupa's ongoing novels uh, the latter threw the manuscript um, uh, uh, into the river ganges which was flowing beside their house at chinsura and that she was to repent afterwards later when onurupa began uh, publishing her works she preferred to write with the pseudonym onupama devi Interestingly, Shonu Kumari Devi, then the author of uh, Bharati, persuaded her to discard her pseudonym and expose her uh, uh, true identity. Writing was not a sin. Shonu Kumari uh, tried to convince Onurupa Devi in one of her letters and encouraged uh, her to send her manuscripts to Bharati. Now, Nirupama Devi, a childhood widow whose Onnu Purna Mondi, Didi, Shamuli. and other novels earn tremendous popularity among contemporary readers was equally hesitant and secretive about her literary pursuits her brother vibhuti bhushan bhatto was also a literary aspirant and the famous novelist sharod chandra chattopadhyay was a close friend of his sharod chandra a regular visitor to the bhatto house at bhagalpur where nirupama spent her immediate a uh, post widowhood years would shower praises on whatever this uh, whatever uh, this child widow uh, wrote nirupama's initial publications were in a hand written magazine brought out by her brother bibhuti bhushan and his circle of friends but she chose not to write with her own name initially publishing as shrimoti devi she later adopted the pseudonym onurupa devi uh, sorry onupama devi the same pseudonym that her friend onurupa devi had adopted and even won the kuntolil uh, kuntolin award consecutively in 1904 and 1905 with that pseudonym Now, Shoila Bala Ghosjaya was already married when she began writing. She had to write secretly in between her endless domestic chores because her marital relatives were not too well disposed to her literary preoccupations. It was her husband, then a medical student, who took her manuscripts to Probashi, uh, and her maiden uh, novel, Shekandu. was happily welcomed by the editor of probashi ramanand chattopadhyay uh, in uh, in 1972 shoilawala uh, uh, wrote to marshita devi that probashi is my uh, greatest guru by that time she had already penned more than 30 novels but her life had not been easy her husband became mentally ill hardly 3 years after the marriage and shoilawala wrote 
to earn her living and take care of her ailing husband she uh, had to write i mean it, it was a compulsion it had become a compulsion for her now ashalata shingo's literary career began uh, literally with a bang her debut novel omita prem written at the age of 16 reasonably uh, was appre- uh, was reasonably appreciated by rubindranath tagore uh, generally rubindranath tagore was not very uh, uh, generous about women writers nor was sharachan bachattopadhyay uh, if uh, any of you have read nari uh, lekha uh, then uh, you will understand what i uh, mean now uh, omita prem was followed by several other novels of remarkable merit but unfortunately ashalata wrote little of significance after the age of 26 while her own parents had always been very encouraging and had allowed her to interact with her other budding intellectuals in her hometown bhagalpur uh, ashalata's marital home was relentlessly opposed to her literary pursuits she had to write secretly behind closed doors but eventually she had to stop writing she stopped writing at the age of 26 now asha purna devi wrote with her own name but nobody knew who asha purna devi actually was for a long time because she remained confined with the andor mohol till the age of 38 she never sub- submitted her manuscripts her s- manuscripts herself to the editor or the publisher except on two occasions when she had sent them by post they would invariably be carried to the editor or publisher's office by her husband or her brother brother in law her readers and male counterparts would suspect that Uh, it was a man writing with a w- uh, woman pseudonym as was a trend in those days uh later when asha purna decided to venture outside the andor mohol and attend literary events her male peers such as premendra mitro uh shojani kanto dash and others uh would frankly confess that they had all along believed that the hand that wrote these novels was a man's hand Paradoxically a book authored by a woman was considered immensely saleable by the publishing industry so much so that many men opted for female pseudonyms uh for instance uh, sharod uh, chandro uh, uh, wrote uh, works uh, with the pseudonym anila devi prabhat kumar mukhopadhyay uh, adopted the pseudonym shrimati radhamoni devi uh and there, there are many other examples of this now it is also interesting to note that while british novelists of the victorian era such as charlotte bronte emily bronte george eliot and others adopted male pseudonyms uh, so that they might be regarded as professional writers uh, i mean uh, so that they uh, they were taken seriously their bengali counterparts of the late 19th and early 20th centuries adopted female names other than their own to mask their identities in both cases the attempt to conceal their true identities was a strategy born of fear and an anxiety of authorship uh, uh, the anxiety that invariably entail their engagement in the subversive act of writing and therefore trespassing into the male domain uh the women writers act of subversion could only be compensated by a perfect and flawless domestic role in order to legitimize her rebellious endeavors the literary woman thus adopted the strategy of conformity she conformed in all other ways to patriarchal models of femininity and played the perfect wife the perfect daughter in law the perfect mother and the perfect manager of the household ashtapurna devi served her family um, all day and performed every piece of ritual to please her in laws she found time to write only in the dead of night Lila Mojumdar uh, writes in her autobiography uh, Pagdondi 
writing much at a time was not possible women like me remain perpetually submerged in all kinds of domestic responsibilities my conscience would start hurting if i neglected those and people at home would be displeased it is difficult for a woman to engage in creative pursuits unless she is less encumbered the creative potential how many a woman has thus suffered a miscarriage women have worshiped women who have or worshiped goddess uh, shorashruti in face of criticism are rare thus uh, the early generation of women right bengali women writers attempted the pen in face of relentless hostility and pervasive attitudes of non cooperation and had to adopt the strategies of secrecy anonymity and conformity and other among uh, others to uh, uh, fulfill their sorry, to fulfill their literary aspirations in this way they sought to resist patriarchal attempts to throttle their creativity uh the literary over of women writers in colonial bengal encompassed romance set in the historical or contemporary context and the complexities of conjugal and familial relationships however i Uh, i find that in case of many of these women novelists writing a novel was a self revelatory exercise conspicuously silent about their inner intimate lives and relationships in their autobiographies uh, their fiction nevertheless tended to manifest recognizably autobiographical ele- elements i delved into the personal lives of these novelists and i found that many of them apparently conformed to patriarchal norms in their everyday lives but beneath the veneer of conformity they were torn by dilemmas and the fiction by them uh, paint by them bore the imprints of their inner turmoil through their fiction they sought to uh, set sort answers to the questions that plagued them writing fiction to them uh, was a release uh, uh, for their pent up agonies a quest for the resolution of their dilemmas and inner conflict it was also a means of fulfilling desires and aspirations unrealizable in uh, actual life fiction to these women writers was a safety valve for releasing the angst of conformity and the anxiety um, of non conformity no my whole uh, uh, interest in women's fiction stems for, from an uh, engagement with the social history of late colonial bengal and an understanding uh, that the novel uh, was an artifact that was firmly embedded in that history a focus on the social history of bengal since the middle of the 19th century reveals the burgeoning of an intelligentsia engaged in an obsessive redefinition of womanhood and gender relations an obsession that persisted till as late as the third decades of uh, decade of the 20th century the print medium was utilized by this intelligentsia to redefine the roles and responsibilities of the bengali woman precisely the high caste uh, bengali class hindu woman and reconceptualize in particular the ideological premises of conjugality leading to an enormous production of didactic literature such an uh, such a massive ideological exercise involved at one level 
a reworking of tradition and at another the appropriation of certain western ideas and values and the process culminated in the reconstitution of patriarchy and the reinforcement of patriarchal control on women's affect and uh, sex, uh, uh, sexuality uh, the hegemonic aspirations of this new patriarchy were not unchallenged uh were however not unchallenged why the novel was at times deployed uh, to advocate the dominant conceptions of womanhood and conjugality generating a uh, 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 fiction which uh, which was uh, which would be labeled in those times as three part or shoti part uh fiction largely was a site where contesting ideologies of gender relations were fought out albeit uh, inconclusively making it impossible to neatly categorize novels as either conformist or subversive the writing of social fiction in the bengali hindu colonial context was a difficult and complex process and the anxiety to adhere to the dominant gender ideologies of the time was at times in conflict with the spirit of interrogation and defiance conformity and dissent were thus intricately interwoven the overall tendency was to problematize and question rather than to pronounce any definitive ideological position reading uh, the novels of this time thus leaves an impression of an uneasy ambivalence of creativity uh, plagued by dilemmas and con contrary pulls this was as true of novels written by men as by the women authors now while analyzing the ideological tensions that underpinned the writing of the novel in late colonial bengal it is also necessary for uh, a social historian to observe the manner in which the novel was received by the contemporary bengali liter literati the critical evaluation of the novel in that milieu was conditioned by the forces of a cultural nationalism that made its presence felt in the later decades of the 19th century this nationalism sought to predicate the spiritual and cultural sovereignty of the hindu nation on a prescribed model of womanhood and expe expected literature to uphold this novel uh, model of womanhood condemning it if it did not however while male novelists were harshly criticized for their portrayal of emotions and relationships that did not conform to the prescribed code of gender relations and while the strangest anxieties were expressed about the detrimental impact of novels on the women readers Uh, a woman a woman's act of writing a novel about divine relationships did not raise uh, uh, much furor in contemporary bengali society the same critics who were up in arms against the male novelists greeted the women novelists with, with condescension patronage nonchalance or absolute silence interestingly a few women novelists were actually appreciated for their celebration of the cherished virtues of womanhood now let me focus on some novels which uh, well you might consider subversive uh, some novels by women uh, the protagonists of uh, uh, of women's novels uh, most protagonists of women's novels uh, defied taboos broke barriers protested against injustice and oppression and chose chose to carve out a domain of activity of their own and earn their livelihood uh, from it and moreover they asserted their right to choose a partner of their uh, of, a, uh, of of their own choice defy a marital bond that was devoid of love and thus they tried to assume control over their own lives 
Now, Uro Titi by Onurupa Devi is about, uh, uh, it's a short story, it's about uh, Omiya, uh, a bright girl, a brilliant girl who talked the board examinations despite being denied school education by her uh, father, very conservative father. Uh, she moreover uh, excelled in mathematics, a subject which her father thought women were incapable of mastering. Omiya developed a phobia regarding marriage, traumatized as she was by the violence that she daily witnessed in a neighboring household. She was apprehensive of similar experiences in her own conjugal life. Uh, however, uh, uh, later, a few years later, she grew a liking for Jyotin, uh, a son of her father's friend, who himself had visited her parents in search of a bride. Moments before she left her parental abode with her husband, uh, after a marriage, she received an anonymous letter alleging that her husband was a drunkard and a debauchee. Now, Omiya sneaked away from her husband's side uh, at the railway station and took shelter at her aunt's house in Noihati. Incidentally, the, uh, the letter was penned by none other than her husband who had come to know about Omiya's fears about marriage and decided to test her. He had expected that Omiya would be unsettled, but he had not anticipated that she would decide to part ways. Now, Jyotin could finally locate her, uh, find her out. Uh, Omiya's aunt uh, uh, was also her uh, relative, uh, related to him in some way. There, he revealed his trick, how he had wanted to test Omiya and was satisfied that she had passed the test. Marriage, uh, he believed, could only be founded on mutual trust and respect. And these qualities should be important to the wife as well. Uh, matters were sorted out and then the couple lived happily uh, ever after. Now, in Nirupama Devi's Bidhi Lipi, Kaktayani revealed her love for uh, uh, one Mohendro before ending her life. She was supposed to marry uh, Kamak Khanath, with whom her deceased father had uh, arranged her marriage. However, unable to overcome her love for Mohendro, uh, she ended her life choosing death over a, a conjugal life that was devoid of life. In Shita Devi's Bonna, uh, mm, mm, uh, we find resonances of the Rukmabai episode uh, that happened sometime in the 1880s. Now, Shubhanna Lata had been forced into a marriage in her childhood by her mother uh, without even the knowledge of her father. Uh, now, Shubhana, uh, Shubhana had a harrowing experience in her in-laws. In uh, she escaped from their house and then uh, uh, her father uh, decided not to send her back again. And um, Pratul Chandra took her to Calcutta. She was rechristened. Shubhana and sent to Delhi. And there she enrolled in a medical college to pursue, a, to become a doctor. It was at this point that she met Sudarshan, uh, another medical student. Uh, they fell in love for uh, each other. Uh, 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 they fell in love with each other. And um, but Shuparna was hesitant to reciprocate his feelings. Uh, even though nobody in Delhi knew about her past, uh, how could Shuparna be oblivious of her marital status, even though her brief marital life had been nothing but a nightmare? She was, after all, a Hindu wife with no right of remarriage. She rebuffed Sudarshan but suffered terribly within. In the meantime, uh, her mother-in-law had died and her husband Sri, Libas, Sri, uh, Sri Bilas uh, became eager to renew his conjugal life with Shuparna. Shuparna decided to go back to her husband's house but made it clear that there would be no sexual intimacy unless Shuparna herself wanted it. She was soon to repent her decision. Once again, uh, she escaped from her husband's house, this time with a firm resolve not to re-enter his portals. Uh, 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 
I mean, in the end, Shuparna and Sudarshan were united, but Sri Vilas had to die in order to uh, uh, sort out matters in favor of the lovers. Uh, his death, after all, left Shuparna widow, and a widow was legally eligible for remarriage. Uh, in Bonna, Shita Devi was left with little choice but to invoke death to emancipate Shuparna uh, uh, from a stifling marriage and enable her to marry the man of her choice. In Shithir Shidur, a short story by Shita Devi's elder sister Shanta Devi, a newly married girl who had entered conjugal life with all the romantic illusions typical of her age, found her dreams shattered by the ruthless indifference of her husband. Moreover, her husband was uh, disloyal. Uh, she returned to her parents' home, vowing never, never to go back. Uh, so she threw away her conch bangles uh, um, and walked out of the house, and she never came back again. Now, she was reproached by one of her sisters-in-law in a letter that as a Hindu woman, she had committed a grave sin by throwing away her sacred bangles. It was the duty of every Hindu woman, she pointed out, uh, to stay by her husband's side, however bad he might be. Uh, this girl replied that had she really been her husband, had this man really been her husband, she, he would have never dreamt of leaving her or being disloyal to her hmm. she, uh, she could uh, no she could not uh, uh, regard as husband a man whose heart was with somebody else and in this way she repudiated the marriage while i highlight uh, women's acts of rebellion against marriage and conjugality in the novels discussed uh, uh, the novels that I discussed uh, just now. I wish to point out uh, that none of the above authors were uh, self-avowed feminists. Uh, Onurupa Devi and Nirupama Devi had been consistently appreciated by critics uh, of their own time for their celebration of the ideals of Shotito and Patibrotto and played down by feminist critics uh, uh, of, of our time for their uh, uh, adherence to the patriarchal moral code. In Urochiti, Onurupa Devi did uphold Pati Brutto, but it was Pati Brutto with a difference. Mutual respect and fidelity, reciprocity, and not unilateral commitment were posited as the indispensable bedrocks of conjugality, in the absence of which marriage was a sham and could be dissolved. This was the message that comes through this story from the pen of one who had publicly railed against proposals, proposals for legalization of divorce. Nirupama Devi lived a life that was apparently conformist. Uh, she was a child widow who did not remarry, but then uh, her protagonist valued love above uh, anything else. And, uh, and uh, it is, uh, I mean, uh, people say that uh, Shorachandra Chattopadhyay was in love with Nirupama Devi, but Nirupama did not reciprocate his feelings. But uh, in her writings, uh, uh, Nirupama Devi was a different person who treasured love and considered a uh, uh, marriage born devoid of love to be a, sh a sham. Shita Devi and Shanta Devi, uh, daughters of Ramanandu Chattopadhyay, this very progressive Brahmo reformer and editor of Probashi, had love marriages themselves, but they did not publicly agitate in favor of women's rights. And moreover, uh, uh, they did not. Uh, they did not uh, uh, work, I mean, they did not seek professional em employment, even though they had been offered very good jobs. In all the novels that I've discussed, elements of conformity to the patriarchal moral code are also not hard to discern. I do not, however, underplay or feel embarrassed by such conformity. On the other hand, I wish to draw attention 
to the deeply entangled processes of victimization resistance and complicity to the constantly shifting positions within patriarchy indicating an authorial subjectivity that was both a victim and an agent a rebel and a conformist a subjectivity that was constantly reinvented uh, and which co constantly repositioned itself in its struggle uh, against patriarchy thank you i end here uh, thank you ma'am for this uh, uh, brilliant lecture and now i request uh, our uh, professor uh, Mr. Shudipta Mondol to kindly conduct the question answer session. And thereafter, I have a question to ask. Just please ask the question as that has been posted in the chat box. Shudipta. Okay, Shubham. Okay, Shubham. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, ma'am, for this uh, wonderful lecture. With your permission, we can now move on to the Q&A session. Uh, we have a question. Uh, yes, it's on the screen. We have a question from Meghamonti and Jaydeep Bhattacharya from the live stream. The question is on the screen. Uh, Could you please read the out? question? Yes, yes, yes I can't. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, okay, okay ma'am. Let me mm -hmm. read out the question. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Good evening, ma'am. Even though a fiction full of unrealistic events, how was Sultana's Dream by Rokia Sakhavat Hussain so widely accepted even at that time? That was it really widely accepted? Uh, I doubt so. Uh, Rokia Hussain was uh, was uh, very harshly criticized for her writings. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, uh, later her writings gained a lot of prepare, uh, a lot of popularity and uh, uh, invited a lot of critical attention. But I don't think Rokia was very popular in her own time. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, 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 her Sultana's dream is really uh, 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 an uh, it's, it's really a game-changing novel. It's, it's a novel that it's not a novel. It's a uh, kind of a, uh, I won't call it a novel, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a it's a fictional uh, essay. Uh, but uh, well. Uh, you have to uh, take into account the fact that even though a novelist might not gain uh, popularity and acceptance in her own time, uh, later, later, much later, she might uh, get uh, get acc accolades for her writing. Her writings may be appreciated by later day critics. Okay, and I think that that was true of Sultana's dream. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your hmm. answer. Um, since we don't have any other question from the stream, I request my friend and colleague, Dr. Shubham Dutta, to ask his question directly. Uh, uh, with your permission, ma'am, uh, just, I just want to know, since I teach uh, Amar Jibon as part of uh, the CBCS syllabus, so what we come across in women's autobiographies uh, written at that point of time is an overwhelming... Uh, obsession with the question of spirituality. This, the question of spirituality remains intrinsic to almost all of the literary autobiographical texts produced during that point of time. So do you think that the use of spirituality in this text comes as a mode of uh, veneer, comes as a mode of facade in order to avoid uh, or in order to uh, critique the actual reality, which was far more dystopic for the women at that point of time. So do you find the the realm of the use of spirituality to be a guard or to be a veneer, to be a facade? That's my uh, question is precisely that. Why so much of engagement with spirituality, although uh, there are many sarcastic depictions of God. In fact, in Amar Jibon, uh, we find that uh, the protagonist is constantly referring to Daya Madhav or uh, other mm. uh, gods so that mm -hmm. he can justify her position and uh, and it 
goes well with the conventional nationalist patriarchal trope that uh, the women belong to the spiritual sphere and men belong to the material sphere. The spirituality and materiality dialectic Parthi Chatterjee speaks about later on. So, mm -hmm. uh, what, why do you think that this but, in uh, is well, so uh, Amar Jibon was a unique uh, piece. It was a unique autobiographical piece. Uh, do you find that that the same spiritual spiritual element, the uh, the, uh, the this very strong spiritual element in other autobiographies that were written by women uh, at this time. Say, for instance, Indira Devi Chaudhurani's Sriti Shamput or Sharola Devi Chaudhurani's uh, Jibonir Chora Pata or for that matter, Sharod Kumari Dev's uh, this, uh, Amar Shum Sharbar Kichu Akta. So, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I think you should not generalize because uh, uh, at least in the novels that I've read, spirituality does not really uh, figure uh, in a big way. Uh, women uh, did not write much about uh, these things, about uh, de devotion or uh, uh, about gods, goddesses or worship or devotional themes were not really uh, very, uh, I mean, very significant in women's tropes, I mean, in women's writings. Uh, they prefer to uh, write about familial relationships, uh, family drama and all. And of course, romance was their favorite. Um, well, uh, there's a lot of diversity in, in, in the way in which women represented themselves. And we should not generalize. That is what I'd say. Because I've re uh, read a lot of autobiographies uh, um, apart from uh, Amar Jibon. And I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of diversity in in the, in the in their in the way they have revealed themselves and of course in amar jibon spirituality was a god but uh, 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 but you, you don't find the same uh, uh, spiritual fervor in say in other autobiographies which are written uh, uh, later in the early decades of the 20th century yes ma'am so with this i just uh, come uh, arrive at another question do you find the fictional works produced at that point of time simply overlapping with the literary autobiographies that are uh, produced during that yes that, that was the point that i tried to make but i could not elaborate that uh, that at times um, an, uh, 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 an autobiography uh, was uh, i mean uh, i mean uh, a woman, uh, uh, a writer, often uh, chose to reveal herself in the fictional format. Hmm. I mean, actually, she was writing her autobiography, but uh, but she was presenting it in the fictional format. For instance, Moitre Devi's No Hon Nothe. If you see the uh, title pages of this book, it has been uh, re uh, uh, represented as an as a novel, as an as a uponash. But actually, it was not so. It was her autobi autobiography. Hmm. The same could be said about Ash uh, about uh, some of Ashalata Shingo's novels. They were uh, they were overtly autobiographical. You can identify the autobiographical elements in these novels. Hmm. But they were written as novels. Hmm. And uh, I mean, uh, 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 the I mean, the author was there. I mean, she was the protagonist, but with a different name. Hmm. So yes, yeah, sometimes uh, uh, these women writers they uh, deployed the fictional format to uh, reveal themselves. Hmm. Yes. So uh, this idea hmm. of uh, what Eliot called depersonalization is happening just hmm. to avoid yes. the backlash of patriarchy. That yes, they yes, were absolutely. Writing as I, and they would hmm. have hmm. to face the front of patriarchy, and that's why uh, absolutely. They were adopting the uh, verbs of different uh, through mm -hmm. different and so on absolutely okay. you're right absolutely thank you ma'am so uh, shudipto uh, uh, with this uh, please uh, deliver the vote of thanks and we will uh, we have come to the end of the lecture no uh, there is another question i guess in the uh, chat box uh, it's by shoura bank right uh, would you please tell us something about the relationship between the author and their writing? I think uh, Shorab Babu has joined late and ma'am has already uh, quite elaborately talked about the relationship between the author and their writings. So thank you. Uh, yes, I think the personal life of the author is important. Uh, 
I mean, important to us uh, who do history. I mean, who practice history. <laughs> it may not be important to uh, see your scholar of uh, English literature or Bengali literature for, but for historians. Uh, I mean, Moshita Devi's personal life is important to us <laughs> if you want to evaluate her writings. <laughs> So, Shudip Tota, with this, please uh, deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, today's speaker, Dr. Aparna Bandhapadhyay, for her wonderful lecture on women's fiction in colonial Bengal. Thank you, ma'am, for your brilliant presentation. It was really a pleasure listening to your lecture, and we look forward to listening to your lecture again in future. Uh, I also want to express my gratitude to uh, our chief patron, Principal Ma'am, Dr. Atushi Karfa, for her constant support. She has been a real source of inspiration for us. I also uh, wish to thank uh, Dr. Shanchita Sen, uh, who, has, who has attended uh, today's lecture uh, for her uh, support because she has been, uh, she is uh, the uh, IQSC coordinator of our college. Thank you, ma'am, for your presence as well as your guidance. And I also wish to thank my colleagues, uh, HOD of our department, uh, Mr. Rajkumar Borman, and all my colleagues from the Department of English. Last but not least, I convey my gratitude to those who, to all our students who have uh, listened to this lecture or will listen to this lecture later and also other viewers and uh, or listeners. Thank you, everyone, and uh, good evening. So I leave, Shubham? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.